Romans 12 verses 9 to 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, when you draw us into your family, you want more than just a legal relationship with us. You want us to share your family likeness. And so we pray this morning as we study your word that you'd give us humble hearts and minds that are receptive to what you're doing by your spirit in us. Amen. Well, I wonder if you've ever found yourself listening in on parents comparing notes on perhaps their respective children. There's a phrase you hear them using to each other again and again. Oh, Johnny, he's really got the, the football bug. Practices his kicks for hours. Knows all the players' statistics. Got his heart set on playing for Saints when he's older. Oh, really, uh, says the person they're talking to, perhaps. Well, our, our Lucy, well, she's got the acting bug. You should hear her in her room, reciting her lines day after day. Everything's so dramatic, she wants to audition for every part in the school play. And on it goes. Turns out Rob's got the music bug, and Lydia's got the environmentalism bug, and Tom's got the carpentry bug, and, and so on. They've all got the bug. It's an odd expression, isn't it, when you come to think about it? Wouldn't be surprised if it maybe falls out of use uh, in the post-corona world. But you know what it means when people use that expression? They've got the bug. It means, I guess, I guess that this uh, person has been so gripped by their enthusiasm for whatever it is, that it's led to a new energy, new priorities, a new appetite, a new ambition. They're barely recognizable as the person they were before. It's all totally changed for them. They've really got the bug. Well, let me ask you, and uh, I'll ask myself the same question. Have you and I got the gospel bug? You may well have the gospel. I don't assume that by any means, of course. You may still be dipping your toe into Christian things. But you may have. You may have got the gospel. Perhaps you've been chosen and, and loved and forgiven and adopted into the family of God. That may all be true. But have you actually got the gospel bug? How far has your new spiritual reality actually shaped the person you are? The, the life you live, the way you expend your, your energy, your priorities, your appetites, your ambitions. Have you really got the bug? You may be a Christian. You may call yourself that, a Christian, a, a Jesus person, in terms of your profession of faith. But how far are you a Jesus person in terms of your heart and your life? How far is the, the, the truth that you know also a truth that you feel? 
and a truth that you live. Some years ago, a, a book came out which caused anger and resentment among Christian people the world over. It was written by an astrophysicist called Michael Hart, and it was called The 100. The subtitle was a ranking of the most influential persons in history. And what riled Christians so much was that Jesus came out only third in the rankings, behind Muhammad and Isaac Newton. Well, not surprisingly, Michael Hart was grilled about this seeming anomaly a number of times, <clears throat> but his answer pierced like a knife. He said, I am neither a Christian nor a Muslim, but on my observation, Muhammad has far more influence on the lives of Muslims than Jesus on the lives of Christians. Ouch. But what do you think? Is that fair? Is it fair for you and me? We can only really answer for ourselves, can't we? So let me come back to that question. Are you really a Jesus person? through and through. Have you really got the gospel bug? Last week, we reached a turning point in our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. If you've got it open in front of you there, uh, you can see for yourself, Paul is moving as he starts chapter 12, from the facts of what God has done for us, who he's been to us, to the life of response. The verse 1, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's moved from a new understanding to who we are in the whole of our lives. Middle of verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We've begun to see what that looks like um, in the first half of the chapter. But from this point on, from verse 9 uh, towards the, 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 the end of the chapter, he, he goes on with this kind of rapid-fire barrage of instructions. Now you look down the list there, and I don't know what your reaction is at first glance. It seems to me like a whole mishmash of just random things. Maybe you've got somewhere in your house that all the assorted things go that haven't got a place of their own. Maybe a garage or, or a shed or just a kitchen drawer. For us, it's a, it's a room up in our loft. We call it the room of doom. It's full of spare jiffy bags and rolls of wrapping paper and ancient picture frames and memorabilia and all sorts of things, odds and ends of every kind. So is this passage here in Romans 12, the room of doom of the letter. Not quite, I don't think. It's not entirely straightforward to navigate through the commands, but it seems to me Paul is showing us what it looks like to get the gospel bug in three different areas. Your first, getting the gospel bug will show itself in unmasked love towards your church. So verse 9, Love must be sincere. Uh, we know something of what love is, I suppose. Uh, we've been shown love by God himself. Most spectacularly of all, in the way the Lord Jesus came and lived and died for us. Now, our culture may talk about love as, at heart, something that makes you feel good. What Jesus shows us is that real love is about seeking the good of others. Feeling good yourself may or may not be part of the deal. It might be. It's wonderful what it is, that's for sure. But it wasn't for Jesus, wrenched with grief in Gethsemane or dying of asphyxiation on the cross. Love is putting yourself on the line for another. And this love has got to be the lifeblood of the church, Paul wants to say. He talks about this elsewhere in his writings. He homes in on it, uh, just here in Romans 12. 
And it's got to be real love. It's got to be authentic, sincere. That word sincere actually comes from the world of acting. In the ancient world, when an actor stepped into character, he didn't order an elaborate costume or a hire a makeup team. He just donned a mask, much as we're doing at the moment, uh, every day, I suppose. But this mask that they would don was specifically used to create a pretense, a difference between the, uh, the person the actor uh, wanted to, to be, uh, to show himself as, and the actor they, or the person they really were. A gospel-driven love knows no such difference. There's no mask, no pretense. What you see is what's really there. Which means this love is genuinely wanting to commit to other people. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Church is our family. And uh, yes, of course, as we know from our own contexts, family relationships are not always smooth going. There are upsets and distractions, irritations along the way, but still, they're always going to be your family. They're not going anywhere. So we're able to, and we must commit to church, come what may. And this love is genuinely wanting to elevate other people. End of verse 10. Honour one another above yourselves. Do we enjoy making each other look good? Or are we too busy trying to make ourselves look good? I mean, do we actually think that the spiritual brother or sister that maybe we don't have all that much in common with, is in fact more important than we are. Do you genuinely think that? And, and down in verse 13, this love is genuinely wanting to look after others. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Can I just say, MasterChef and Bake Off and Grand Designs and all those kind of programs, they have a lot to answer for, don't they? They've left us all thoroughly intimidated about the prospect of having people around to, to, to our place. Now, can we really open the door to people when we've got these piles of kids' dirty clothes over there and there's a smell of burnt lasagna coming from the kitchen over there? The answer is, yes, we can. Don't let your house-proud, neat freak, master chef groupie nature get in the way of just looking after people. They're not coming to your house to admire your house or, 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 or to be impressed by your cooking. They're coming to spend time with you. Remember, at heart, hospitality is just a lubricant for growing relationships. And then again, this love is genuinely wanting to share life with others. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. The Christian life is a shared life, and shared both in the ups and the downs. A church is a body, as we saw last week. And as a body, the, the whole rises and falls in response to each individual part. We're a single organism. You hurt? I find myself hurting. You got something to celebrate? I want to celebrate with you. Of course, that does involve a willingness to self-disclose, to share what's on our hearts which does mean making ourselves vulnerable to other people. And that is hard for some. But it also means, on the other hand, being deeply interested in the lives of others and not just preoccupied with ourselves. That too doesn't come naturally to everyone. In fact, I wonder which of those two is more of a challenge for you. 
Maybe spend some time this afternoon having a think about that. And then again, this love is genuinely wanting to maintain relationship with others. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. In a biggish church family like ours, it's impossible to enjoy the same deep sense of connection with everyone. Impossible. But it is important to make sure there aren't people we actively avoid or moan about or look down on. That kind of attitude can't be right, can it? When every one of us owes everything we have and everything we are to the grace of God. Committing to others around us in the church. Elevating others. Looking after others. Sharing life with others. Maintaining relationship with others. This is how sincere love, love without a mask on, shows itself. And that's part of what really getting the gospel bug will mean for each of us. But second, getting the gospel bug will show itself not just in the church, but in our very hearts, in undying hope. Look at the start of verse 12. Be joyful in hope. Now here's the thing, when you swim in the waters of a now-obsessed world, a live-for-the-moment world like the world we know, it is the easiest thing imaginable to drink some of it in, isn't it? To allow that short-sightedness to ooze into our mindsets. You don't have to think about it, it just happens. But of course, as Christian believers, our proper time frame is eternity. Do you remember at the end of Romans chapter 8, how, uh, how Paul waxed lyrical about that everlasting security of the Christian believer? What does he say? Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And thanks to Jesus, eternity is our horizon. No, not tomorrow or next year or even retirement. Eternity. And that changes everything. I wonder if you heard about that rather brutal experiment of Kurt Richter back uh, in the 1950s. Uh, he was working with rats. He put some of these wild rats into large buckets of water just to see how long they'd last. Now, rats are meant to be great swimmers, but in fact, they only lasted 15 minutes before they gave up and drowned. He repeated the experiment, though, did it again. And this time, just as they were starting to give up, he took them out, dried them off, rested them, and then put them back in again. Do you know how long they lasted this time before giving up? 60 hours. It was an astonishing change. But that's what hope does, even for rats. Thoughts of what the future may hold yet radically change our ability to persevere in the here and now. In particular, Christian hope helps you exercise discernment. So, verse 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Uh, you've noticed this as much as I have, I'm sure. There's enormous pressure on us to be positive about pretty much everything today. It, it, it does our heads in, doesn't it? But still we feel we've got to approve of anything and everything. You know, what will people think of us if we disapproved of their life choices or their opinions or, or whatever it might be? But if heaven is our horizon, if, if that's where our hearts really are, that gives us a framework to resist that pressure, a point of reference, as it were, 
And not everything has a future in the presence of God, so not everything has to be commended or approved of in the present. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Discernment, then. And again, hope helps you to stay on the boil. So just look down again at verse 11. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That's a great encouragement, isn't it? Maybe one we particularly need to hear. I mean, I mean don't you find yourself sometimes buying into the cynicism or the apathy of people you know? I wonder if your service of Jesus has become half-hearted as that cynicism or apathy starts to work its way into our own hearts, get under our own skin. Are you just drifting along? Well, look, as, as hope does grip our hearts, the, the destination we're heading for will surely affect the enthusiasm we have along the way. Fervor, zeal, staying on the boil. We know where we're going. So let's act like it. Well, what would, that, what would that look like? Well, verse 12, staying on the boil would look like keeping on rejoicing. It looked like keeping on putting up with things that are hard, keeping on talking to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. The great breakthrough of the microwave oven back when I was uh, young was that uh, our food could now be cooked from the inside out, as it were. Well, that's what hope does for somebody with the gospel bug. It warms our very hearts towards the Lord and leaves us bubbling over with fervor as we give our lives to him afresh each and every day. Undying hope in our hearts. And then finally, that gospel bug will show itself in an unflappable peace towards the world. I wonder if you've come across one of those people who's always taking offence at the tiniest thing. It's almost like they're just waiting for some little failing to react against, willing you on to, to let them down in some way, just so they can let you know about it. And don't they make sure that you do know about it when you... They ring any bells? Anybody like that in, in your particular circle? But then there are others, aren't there, who are just unruffleable. However much they're provoked, they just seem to take it on the chin. They don't hit back. They just move on. It's the second of those that are to be our model, according to the Apostle Paul, as he continues here in these uh, closing verses of the chapter. So verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, of course, that is a qualification, live at peace with everyone. Payback is simply not in the vocabulary of the Christian believer. If you've ever read The Count of Monte Cristo, you'll have seen what revenge really looks like. That spirit when it grips the human heart. Edmund Dantes in the story is falsely accused of supporting the disgraced Napoleon and is condemned to life imprisonment. But he escapes after 14 years. And thanks to a tip-off from a fellow inmate, he lays his hands on an enormous treasure. And what does he do with that newfound wealth? Well... He uses it to help out old friends, yes, but also, and a much greater length and seemingly much greater enthusiasm, to wreak vengeance on those involved with locking him away those years ago. One by one, a poisoning here, a suicide he engineers there, a bankruptcy over there. He nails them all, and he loves it. I feel, he says at one point, that the most beautiful, noblest, most sublime thing in the world is to recompense and punish. The Count of Monte Cristo is the flag waver for anybody today who wants to settle a score. 
But of course, Jesus is, is quite the reverse, isn't he? He didn't hit back at all. He barely uttered a word as he was falsely accused and charged and tortured and killed. And those who follow Jesus are to learn from their leader. So verse 19 here. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, Paul says. Well, why not? Well, because you don't need to. You already know the end of the story. You know that justice will be done. So let it be done. And let God be the doer of it. So back in verse 19 again, leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. It's so liberating that, isn't it? We can just get on and show Christian kindness even to our wrongdoers. So verse 20, feed your enemy. Verse 21, overcome evil with good. We can do that to people who've wronged us. Why? Because we know the future. We know how the story ends. The justice will be done. Now, if you've been racked by hurts and trauma, if you've been used and abused, there are many things that God would want to say to you by his word. There may even be some things you need to do and to say. But in the end, you have to leave it to God. And if you do, if you really do, you may find that he transforms you into that person of unflappable peace towards the world. So have you got the gospel bug? Has the gospel got under your skin? Has it changed how you relate to church? How you are in your heart? How you are towards the world? And those who hurt you? Let's pray together as we close. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you afresh for the gospel of the Lord Jesus, by which you showed us your mercy and forgiveness and brought us into your family. We ask today that you would so bed in that gospel into our minds and our hearts that our lives really are transformed to his greater glory. Amen.